views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Hello and welcome to Open, the one and only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Cristina Pagan, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our community. Coming up on today's show, we'll find out about a Bronx-based nonprofit organization that is dedicated to providing underheard youth with the tools and opportunity for self-expression. Then it's a little history lesson as this year marks the 375th anniversary that our borough's namesake Jonas Bronx came to the Bronx. After that, we'll uncover alcohol's hidden harms in a collection of stories from everyday New Yorkers. And finally, Transportation Alternatives is on a mission to reclaim New York City streets. But from what? You'll have to wait and see because all this and much more is headed your way because we are now officially abierto. Hello everyone, I'm your host Cristina Pagan and today is Wednesday, July 16th and of course you're watching Open, the only live and interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. We want to encourage you to stay connected to us. You can find us on Twitter at BronxNet TV and Facebook at Open BronxNet Television. This year marks the 375th anniversary that our borough's namesake, Jonas Bronx, from Sweden became the Bronx's first European settler. Here to tell us more about connecting Jonas Bronk and the Bronx to Swedish roots is Brian Anderson. Welcome, sir. Good morning. Thank you. Christina. Good morning. So tell us a little bit about what got you started and interested in Jonas Bronk and his connection to the Bronx. Well, while a history major here at Lehman College uh, a number of years ago, I discovered my own ancestry was part Swedish, and I have never pursued that. Mm -hmm. uh, genealogy was a growing craze at the time. I kind of jumped on board with both feet, and discovering this particular link, I was rather pleased. And then I heard from Lloyd Ultan at the Bronx County Historical Society that someone had written some kind of a monograph indicating that Bronx, who we thought was either Dutch or Danish, was actually Swedish. And this was genealogical proof. So I ordered documents from Holland where Bronx had signed his name and found out conclusively that he was. So we did, had a kind of a dual track where I was tracing my own Swedish lineage and making a, my name highlighting this aspect of Jonas Bronx. That's, that's very interesting uh, that, you can ha that technology has gotten to that point where you can find those records and put that sh that the, the two things together. Well, it wasn't technology at the time. <coughs> well, actually. I mean, <laughs> in terms of like being able to have the access to it, I mean. That's true, yeah. Um, yeah. So, what, what in your discovery of your own roots, what did you also discover about Jonas Bronk? Well, we come from somewhat the same area of s southern Sweden. Uh, our immigration patterns was a little bit different. He, was, he made his way to Amsterdam, New Amsterdam, uh, Amsterdam, I'm sorry, in Holland. Mm -hmm. Uh, he married a Dutch girl, got on a Dutch ship, and came to what was then a Dutch city. No wonder we thought he was Dutch. There you go. And he settled the mainland portion, which, you know, he signed his own deal not only with the Dutch West India Company, but also with the Indian inhabitants at the time, which was a smart move on his part, and we chalk it up to his Swedishness that he did so. Uh, <laughs> his Swedishness. <laughs> and, and the most we know about Jonas Bronk was the fact, because uh, he died four years later at a very early age, but he left a will mm -hmm. that indicated quite, quite a huge number of holdings. Uh, he, he could have been the richest man in New Amsterdam at the time, from what we, what we find. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what we know about Jonas Bronck. He has no children, he has no descendants, but either his nephew or his cousin, Peter, mm -hmm. who was present at the, at the reading of his will, did move upstate and has many, many descendants in the United States who always thought they were related to Jonas. Mm -hmm. Bad news is they're not. They are, they are related to the family but not to Jonas himself. Oh, not a direct descendant. Not a direct descendant, I precisely. See. So then what did you also discover about yourself in your, your findings? Well, my, I, I discovered where particularly in Sweden they came from. I mean, when, you're, when you're doing genealogy, it's kind of tough to know exactly where you're from mm -hmm. in, in the old world because typically by the time you take an interest in it, and I've heard this from many, many people of, of a certain age, that all their relatives are deceased. I should have asked them these questions when they were alive. Right. Well, they didn't talk about it too much when they were alive because it wasn't always a happy story. So for many of us that are two and three generations removed, it, it's, quite, it's quite an effort. Mm -hmm. It's all about document retrieval, putting pieces together. It's a real, real Sherlock Holmes story after a while. Right. So 
well, this is the 375th anniversary of Bronx arrival here Precisely. in the Bronx. What, what do we need to know about the Bronx's founder? Well, as I say, we don't know too much about him. We, we now know, at least, that he was a Swede. He wasn't Danish. He wasn't Dutch. He was from this country called Sweden. We know exactly where, because of documents that he signed when he was in Holland, uh, it indicates the exact town in Sweden that he's from. Mm -hmm. Now, for about 30 years, 35 years, I've been putting this all together. I initiated the 350th anniversary. 25 long years ago <laughs> and since that time there's been a growing interest in Sweden with the connection because Swedes love the fact that they've got a little piece of New York that's named <laughs> for a fellow countryman so much so now that they've opened a place called the Jonas Bronx Center in Sweden it's a beautiful building we'll be doing a ribbon cutting there I think in we're, we're looking at that right oh, there now. you go that's right right in the town of Sevsha that's a tough one to say but that's the Jonas Bronx Center I was just there about a month ago there is a gentleman that is brewing a liqueur uh, called Jonas Bronx Spirit so I mean, oh my. So there's really, <laughs> there's really quite an interest being taken in this man known as Jonas Brunk and the fact that a large part of New York City is named for this guy. And we realize how unique the Bronx is. We're, we're the only part of New York City that's actually named for a specific person. Mm -hmm. We're the only borough that has a river that runs through it. Mm -hmm. It's Bronx River. That's right. And we're always confused as to why it's called the Bronx because it's named for the river, like the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean. Right. The article comes from the fact that it's named after a river, which was in turn named for Jonas Bronk. Gotcha, gotcha. So was there a, such a craze in Sweden before they realized there was a connection? A uh, craze? Was, yeah, in terms of like uh, the brewing of this particular spirit or, some, or having the Jonas Bronk Center, was something like that happening before? No, I have to say over the last 25 years, I had no indication that there was any interest whatsoever. Uh, a former consul general who was based here in New York, who was very enthusiastic about the connection, mm -hmm. found out from people in this particular province that there was an interest. Mm -hmm. and told me about it. And they were interested in what, we, what, we, what, what were we doing for the 375th anniversary. And I just thought it was a basic inquiry. I had no idea that a fellow of Memes mm -hmm. had actually bought the town hotel, named it the Jonas Bronx Center. This thing was taking on full steam at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was very encouraging to me mm -hmm. that there is now finally this interest in Sweden. But I wouldn't say a, a craze, no. It's, it's, it's gathering momentum, though. Are they, discover, are, are they looking into any more discoveries, trying to find out more about him, or are they just putting his name up on things and trying to bring tourists? Actually, it's funny you should say that. The, the town that he's from, uh, the, the church that he was baptized in, in the year 1600, now keep in mind, that's a long time ago. Yeah. We don't have anything in New York City that comes close to that in age. Not really. The church he was baptized in in the year 1600 was already 400 years old. Oh, my. Church is still there. There's going to be a service in that church on the day of the ribbon cutting so in amazing. August, which is, which is amazing. And uh, the interest on the other side is also there's part of his family that never emigrated. So there's part of his family that are still there. Now, granted, it's 10 generations removed. It's 375, at least 375 years later. Right. Uh, so there are Bronx relatives there that find this interesting. Again, because the capital of the world, New York City, has a part of it that's named for a Swede from their town. That's right. Um, is the Bronx doing anything to celebrate this? Have you initiated some sort of uh, well, certainly, celebration? Certainly. Uh, as we did uh, for the 350th anniversary with uh, Borough President Ferrer, Borough President Diaz has also uh, taken on uh, a dual anniversary. It's not only the 375th anniversary of Bronx arrival, but it's also the 100th anniversary of the formation of Bronx County Correct. as a county. And that's, that's, that's also important because for a long time, and the Bronx grew up differently from the rest of New York City. We were actually part of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're a special stepchild in a way, but uh, <laughs> now we're standing on our own two feet as our own county. That's right, I think we're still battling over Marble Hill, I believe. <laughs> I guess right? we are, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Is there any, anything else, any, anywhere we can go to find out more information about the 350? Well, certainly the Borough President has his own, uh, his own website as to what's going on this summer uh, for the anniversary. We're hoping to have the Swedish King perhaps come over Yay. and visit Yankee Stadium, so that'll be, that'll be a big deal that we're working on separately. And uh, in Sweden, we have this event going on, and I think it's jonasbronk.se is the website. You'll probably see on the screen. Okay, great. Thank you so much for all your information. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right back. I love being in classrooms like this one and learning new things. But I'm a Brooklyn girl, and I know school can be hard. It's demanding, and we kids have many distractions, lots of other things we could be doing. Sometimes even your friends may tell you that school isn't cool, that it isn't the place to be. Don't listen to them. There's nothing more important than education. It's the key to everything else. 
It helps us understand our world and be better people, better friends, and better citizens. So stay in school, and don't let anyone tell you that you're not good enough or smart enough. Be a star, shine brighter than anyone else, and you'll make the grade. This has been a public service announcement of the Make the Grade Foundation. Go to makethegrade.org to learn more. I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. Una vida plena medida en asientos empieza con los asientos adecuados en la infancia. Los choques son una de las causas principales de muertes de niños de 1 a 13 años. Aprende a prevenirlas con el sistema de seguridad adecuado a cada edad y tamaño. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Bienvenidos. Welcome back to Open. We will continue our conversation with Mr. Brian Anderson. Welcome back, sir. Thank you. So you said you were a history major here at Lehman. Um, Back in the day, back in the and day. and you got interested <laughs> in genealogy. Is that something that you continue yeah. to do? Is that a profession for you? What do you? Well, certainly, yeah. I mean, I became so proficient at it that uh, I became rather famous for it, and it served me well because as, forgive as my a, ignorance, sir. That's right. As, <laughs> as a history major from Lehman College, I got perhaps what was the best job ever. I became the commissioner of the Department of Records for New York City, oh, that's which houses the archives. Mm -hmm. So I met, I spent many a day in the archives back when it used to be all microfilm for the most part. Oh dear. None of this at home. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> sitting in the comfort of your living room t touching buttons. So um, I, I had, had a great time here at Lehman. I lived locally. Uh, great, great history department here. Mm -hmm. yeah, but kind of genealogy was one of those things that grows, grows up alongside you. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was a personal quest. It was a grandparent I didn't know. I wanted to find out where his family was from. Again, my parents knew some of the answers, not really, but the documents are what told the story. Mm -hmm. And that kind of a training, you can only, only find out by doing the work yourself. And how far did you have to dig? How deep did you go? Well, ho every genealogist, they, what they hope to find out is that someone on the other side or somewhere in the family tree, someone has done most of the work. <laughs> yes. So I was lucky enough that when I did get back maybe two generations, discovered a Swedish cousin. I had a cousin that was married <coughs> to a guy who loved genealogy. He, he had done his, his wife, my cousins, whole family tree back about 400 years. Wow. Now I double checked everything because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a records guy. Right. It's okay to give me names and dates, but I want to see this documents, stuff. I want to yes. see the real documents so I can make that determination right. whether it really is a connection or not. Because mm -hmm. it's, it's a slippery slope. You can plug the wrong people into the wrong place mm -hmm. and it goes completely out of whack. My father's actually started doing that for our family as well. And it's a little bit harder um, because we're Puerto Rican immigrants. So we're not, yes. we don't have those same kinds of records and records that were kept on the island or were uh, destroyed at points, mm -hmm. churches burned down. Precisely. Uh, do you have in, like, uh, maybe advice for people who are trying to find their genealogy that don't have those, that kind of access? Well, it'll always depend on accessibility of records. Mm -hmm. Again, as you relate to churches burned down, you know, in Europe they had wars and famines and floods and things were lost in the Irish uprising, 1920s. They burned one of the, the buildings dur during the war, mm -hmm. and three quarters of, of the important records for Irish Americans just disappeared in that fire. So some of us can only get maybe two, like two generations using Irish civil records. Mm -hmm. And if the churches survived, then you might have a, a chance. And it's the same in Puerto Rico. It's, it depends on where the family's from. Right. Um, and it's good to know. I mean, the accessibility is a lot more improved, obviously, because of, because of um, computer accessibility. Right, right. So. You being the commissioner of records, uh, 
do you ha have you personally put in information to help other people in like the internet, or is it something that you have other people do? Like, how does that work? How do people like go to you and access their records? Look, I'm no longer the commissioner of the Department of Records. I, I was there for ten years. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we did do is we uh, embarked on computerizing a lot of the stuff we had. A lot of the stuff, as I say, were mostly old books mm -hmm. and microfilm. Mm -hmm. We brought in volunteer groups, other genealogy groups that did the data entry for the indices. Now, to find a record, you have to know, let's, let's just say a birth record. You have to know what year your parent was born mm -hmm. and where. You find the certificate number, and then you must go to another reel of film and then find the certificate. <laughs> oh, so it's an involved process. Right. Once things are scanned and mm -hmm. computerized from home, you can find the certificate number, which will hopefully link to the image. And that's what's done through Ancestry.com. You don't even see that whole process anymore. It's just so easy to do. Right. But there's still a bulk of records that have not been digitized. When I was commissioner, I made that my mission is to digitize and make available a lot more online mm -hmm. and let people know what we have. Because again, genealogists go in there, kind of, well, what, what is there and how do I go about Overwhelmed, it? Overwhelmed, right? It's a bit overwhelming. It can be. And you can hit brick walls, mm -hmm. and even the best of us do, mm -hmm. where you just have to find other ways around them. Oh, I thank you then for making that your mission. We appreciate that. <laughs> By all that. means. I'm glad to help your family if you oh, have questions. Thank you. Um, so, what, do, what is it that you do now? Are you still looking for information on your family, or have you stopped? Well, I still do genealogy as a hobby. I also do it for clients. I'm a consultant. I'm working on this Jonas Brung project now in Sweden, where they're trying to connect you know, uh, the, the, the county with our county, with Bronx County. Mm -hmm. We're hopefully going to have a sister city designation. We're going to have schools connecting with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, on the real grassroots level, where there's going to be real communication back and forth. I mean, you know, with our iPads now, you can have real conversations right, FaceTime. using FaceTime with, you know, <laughs> kids going to school in Sweden. So that's hopefully what we're going to try to do, just so kids see what, the, what, what it looks like in New York or what it looks like in the, in the rural sections of Sweden. When do you see that happening, the sister city designation? Oh, within a year, certainly. Really? Yeah, the borough president's indicated that uh, that's something he'd like to do. That's fantastic. Yeah, it really is fun. Oh, do you have any other information for us, maybe, that we can look up? It Jones should all be on the Jonas Bronk site. Jonas, Jonas Bronk. Bronk dot se. yes, dot certainly. Se. That's fantastic. So, lastly, mm -hmm. being that this is the 100th anniversary of Bronx County mm -hmm. and 375th anniversary of the namesake, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what what should people expect from the Bronx in the future? How has it changed from what it was to when maybe you were a youth to now? And what do you see in the future for the Bronx? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I, I think the Bronx is as big as our dreams. Uh, you know, leaving college was, was not a big college when I was going here, but it, it's just expanded. I mean, the people that are coming here for education, people coming from all over the world and, and settling in our beautiful borough the future of the Bronx has always been very bright. I mean, just in the last hundred years, you know, I, I think my family emigrated up to the Bronx from Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, as they built the subways. And again, that's about the 19 teams. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always been dreamers. You know, it's always people that want to come to the greatest city in the world and settle somewhere. And why not on the mainland? You know, we've got a lot to offer here. It's it. a great place. We've got great colleges, great institutions. We've got Yankee Stadium. Why, come right. on. That's There's right. The, that's the reason to come Yankees. to the Bronx, you know. I love it. And that's where dreams are made. We got. Derek Jeter, you know, I mean, come on. Respect <laughs> yeah, the that's captain. Right. Exactly right. All right, the Bronx is as big as your dreams. I love it. Thank you so much, Mr. Anderson. My pleasure. We have to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll find out about an organization that believes in developing young voices. We'll be right back. about shoulders. Your shoulders are the three-tier muscle. You have your front delt, you have your rear delt, and you have your mid delt. So when you're working out your shoulders properly, you have to do three different exercises. It's wonderful being able to compete with a lot of these young guys from all over the world. It's important to stay in shape.
Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Jimmy can't sing. And Tommy can't dance. So we're going to put some ants in their pants. Aww. Kids will spend 22 minutes watching us, the super duper party troopers, sing about ants in their pants. Isn't that funny? Ants in their pants, they got ants in their pants. Brushing for two minutes now can save your child from severe tooth pain later. Two minutes, twice a day. They have the time. Welcome back to Open. I'm your host, Cristina Pagan. Voices Unbroken is a Bronx-based nonprofit organization that is dedicated to providing kids the tools and opportunity for creative self-expression. Through high-quality creative writing workshops in juvenile justice facilities, group homes, jails, and various other transitional alternative settings. Here to tell us more is the founder and executive director of Voices Unbroken, Victoria San Martino, and Eileen Newman, executive director of the Center for Bronx Nonprofits. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Welcome. So uh, tell me a little bit about Voices Unbroken. Uh, well, you just read um, our mission statement. So um, <laughs> we, we essentially, we look for young people who are um, in residential, primarily in restrictive residential settings, so they're living in places that they didn't choose to be in, mostly that they've been court mandated to, and the doors don't open from the inside, is what many of these facilities look like. And we offer them creative writing workshops, um, poetry workshops. Um, and so we believe as an organization that everybody has a story to tell and that everyone needs to have the tools and the opportunity to express themselves. Um, both so they have agency over their own story and also so they can build relationships with others. Um, so our workshops generally are about 10 sessions long, so they might take place once a week for 10 sessions or twice a week for five sessions. Um, all of our workshops are facilitated by professional um, teaching artists um, who, who work with us part time. Um, most of our workshops take place after school or in out of school time, sometimes on the weekends. How did you get started uh, with Voices Unbroken? I, well, I grew up here in the Bronx, and I got really good youth services. And, um, and, and then I went on to be an educator. So I was a teacher for, at the school for girls on Rikers Island. And um, I was very young. I started as a teacher, insanely young. And I knew right away that I needed to, I needed more so I could give my students more. And so I resigned my position. I continued facilitating a workshop there for about 10 years. But, um, but I left my position. and kind of organically, no one really organically starts a nonprofit, but, um, <laughs> but you know, different opportunities uh, came up and um, I was able to apply for a very small grant, a $2,000 grant um, back in 2000, right. um, and bought like a computer, a printer, and cardstock and started making brochures and calling it an organization. And so it's grown a lot since then. And, um, and in part, it's grown because of, of um, organizations like, um, like the Center for Bronx Nonprofits. We've been able to get a lot of capacity building support and, um, and network with other organizations. And people have been very supportive, both of the of Voices Unbroken and of the young people that we serve. I think a lot of people think about the young people we serve, mm -hmm. um, but they don't have access to them. It's, it's hard to physically access them. And so, you know, people have been supportive of them as in, well. And their voices that are unheard, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. So Eileen, can you tell us a little bit about the Center for Bronx Nonprofits and your connection with? Sure. With the Bronx. Center for Bronx Nonprofits is now over a year old. Um, it's located at Hostos Community College. We're part of the Workforce Development and Continuing Ed Division, and the mission really was to to look at the nonprofits in the Bronx, to work with them in terms of capacity building, to examine what the needs were, to provide networking opportunities in order to grow the capacity for them to be able to do that work, which ultimately impacts on life in the Bronx. And that's, that's our mission, is mm -hmm. to make life in the Bronx better. And so when I first started, um, uh, there was a list of organizations to go and meet with and people who had been involved for a long time. And so that's why I met Victoria and I really. And I, I also had come out of years ago education, and um, so I was very um, excited and moved by what the kind of work she was doing and the, and the, the, 
the level at which kids were able to express themselves. And, and I had been also working with an, another organization that had done some work in Rikers. So I, I knew, you know, that, that whole, um, once you step into an environment like mm -hmm. that, it really changes your life because, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. the first time I ever went to Rikers was Labor Day, was right before Labor Day weekend and, and the sort of intensity of mm -hmm. going in there and being able to walk out and have this, mm -hmm experience and knowing that these kids would not and so yeah. so I, I had great respect for the work and and Victoria is a real activist and um, a networker and so <laughs> that was a natural and there were many organizations that we're working with in the Bronx and it's really been a wonderful a wonderful experience that's brilliant yeah. thank you um, can you tell me a little bit about voices beyond bars so that's so we have five programs. Um, Voices Beyond Bars is the program through which we work with young people who are um, currently either in detention in the juvenile justice system or incarcerated or detained on Rikers Island. Mm -hmm. um, so you know we do this awful thing in New York State, which hopefully will change soon. But we incarcerate everyone in New York State who's over the age of 16, like on your 16th birthday, um, automatically as an adult. And so there's a whole population on Rikers of 16 and 17 year olds who. Um, there's only two states, it's us in North Carolina that do this, and so every other state, these 16, 17 year olds would be in the juvenile system. Um, mm -hmm. So we work extensively with that population. We also work with um, 18 year olds and, and young adults on Rikers and then, and then with juveniles. Um, when I was first starting the organization, I saw this trend where um, in times of crisis, organizations would a lot of times cut their programming to the most vulnerable young people. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so that's why Voices Beyond Bars has always been its own program, just to make sure that, you know, many years from, you know, years from now when I'm no longer the ED and, you know, you're on, you know, broadcast news, right? <laughs> and we're, you know, many years from now that, there, that, that if somebody wanted to stop, if anyone wanted to stop doing the work, it's hard work to do. It's hard to, act the, not because of the young people, but it's hard to access the facilities, bureaucracy, you know. Bureaucracy, definitely. Yeah, the, the bureaucracy. Um, if anyone ever wanted to stop doing it, that they would have to like cut a whole program. It seemed at the time when I was founding the organization, it seemed like a way to ensure that the work would continue. Mm -hmm. um, and so those young people, I mean, you know, we serve young people who are in detention um, in the juvenile justice system who are as young as 12, you know. Um, we sometimes will have 11 year olds, you know. So, um, so I just think it's, it's um, doing that work, that, that program of ours, is just a reminder for, for all of us, I think, um, within the organization, hopefully, you know, a reminder to, to everyone, right, that, mm -hmm. that there are, we have some systems that are broken and some things that we really need to fix in our community and that, you know, we'll, we'll be more whole when those young people are with us. In terms of that, noticing with your work, you have noticed that there are holes and broken parts of the system. How do you think that we should address that? How New York City and New York State should address that? How do we get the community involved in fixing those problems? I think, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's about community. I think it really, it's, it's understanding that, um, like, young people don't wind up in these systems in a vacuum, right? It's like, what, what are, what opportunities have they had? What, what have they had access to? I think when we look at the communities that young people come from, about 18% of young people who are under the age of 18 in New York City um, live are in the Bronx. Um, and we make up a disproportionate number, our, our children make up a disproportionate number of people, young people in these systems. Um, just based, I've like, in my spare time, I've like, you know, <laughs> literally run like a rest data, just trying to understand why we see so many kids from the Bronx. Um, and it, it looks like about 30% of the kids who are in the juvenile justice system are from the Bronx. So wow. we're really disproportionately represented. I think then we come back to the Center for Bronx Nonprofits and we think, how can we make sure that yeah. the young people who, um, all of the young people in all of our communities have access to all of the services and supports that they need mm -hmm. so that they can grow into the adults that, um, that we need them to be, you know. Right. So, yeah. so Eileen, can you talk a little bit about that um, in terms of the Bronx Center for Nonprofits? I mean, Center for Bronx Nonprofits, what they can do to help, or what other nonprofits that maybe we can direct our youth towards, so that Absolutely. they don't end up in these situations. That's very much part of what we're about, and it, it's working with a lot of organizations that work in the youth sector. So it isn't it isn't just the juvenile cent justice sector; mm -hmm. it's the youth center because sector. Because what we want is for kids to have opportunities to be able to experience a life before with alternatives to what the street often gives them mm -hmm. and and it's i mean it's it's been a huge issue for a long time that many many people have tried to to wrap their head around and solve and mm -hmm. um and so i did want to do a little commercial for something sure. that's coming up because that it, it very much relates to this Absolutely. um new york community trust which is a funder who, who have 
they've, they've been very supportive of the Bronx. They've been very supportive in, in a really kind of wonderful and in some ways very personal way, supporting the people who are working in these organizations. They have a brand new um, request for proposals for a LOI, a letter of intent, so it's not a big <laughs> proposal yet. Um, and, the pr and the grant is called Healthy and Livable Neighborhoods. And it's, it's all about the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And so what they are looking at is, what are all the things that we can do to create neighborhoods where kids really have the opportunities that that I mean, the goal really, you know, Victoria yeah. can write about her experiences after that. But we want organizations like Voices Unbroken and a lot of the other organizations to go away because there's no need. That's yeah. the goal. If I could, if I could have, have my, yeah. you know, that's what yeah. I would love. That yes. we don't need a center for Bronx nonprofits because we don't. So that's the dream. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> sounds a little counterproductive, but all right. Yes, but that's okay. We'll do other things. Right. Um, but. So what New York Community Trust has done is they've, they've looked at the, specifically right now, the South Bronx and said, let's look at all of the issues that we can have nonprofits work on together, which will lead to a healthier, more livable environment in the Bronx, both emotionally, um, physically, psychologically. Mm -hmm. So they are proposing, people um, are going to be submitting LOIs, letter of intents. There is an information sent session because this is brand new. It just came out last week. The information uh, session is going to be Monday, July 21st, this Monday, 3.30 to 5 at the Savoy Center at Hostos Community College, which is 149 and Walton. So everybody is welcome. Um, you can RSVP on the New York Community Trust website. So I would recommend go there or, or send something to me, enewman at hostos.cuny.edu. Um, the LOIs will be due on August 15th and then a group, and, and they will be for groups that mm -hmm. will be coming together. And after that, two will be chosen to, two or one, two, three will be chosen to submit a full proposal and then work mm -hmm. on their program. So, and it's quite a bit of money and it's really a, a wonderful opportunity. Great, thank you so much. I'd love to You're learn welcome. more, but we have to take a break. Okay. So, okay. Um, uh, we have can to I take a quick, a, oh, go ahead. Can I do it very, very quick? This is Voices Unbroken's latest publication, Wanna Go Over the Moonshines. Um, we can send copies to folks for free if they reach out to us on our website. It was um, sponsored by the um, Simone Bolivar Foundation. Great. Oh. Thank you so much. We can close with that. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, we have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more on Open. Stay tuned. Thank you. Everybody has a dream. Mine was to see the ocean. And with a little help, I grew up in the housing projects of Cleveland. I didn't even know that life could be any better than it was. Education for me has been a way to get away from the agony of what was normal life. I want to be able to impact the community, not just look back on where I came from, but to reach back to where I came from and pull some people up with me. My name is David, and I am your dividend. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. Every day, kids witness bullying. Oh, look! Your crush is looking at you. Poor <laughs> you. They want to help, but don't know how. See, no one here is going to help you. No one Teach your kids you. how to be more than a bystander. Visit StopBullying.gov.
Hello, I'm Don J. Lemon from Open 2.01 Bronx Net, the show by teens, for teens, and about teens. Catch us every Friday at 4.30 and anytime on the web by going to www.bronxnet.org. Hi, this is Jeff Fox for 107.5 WBLS. And when I get off the radio, I check out my man, the Dr. Bob Lee. It's open on BronxNet. I never miss it. Welcome back to Open. I'm your host, Cristina Pagan. Transportation Alternative's mission is to reclaim New York City's streets from the automobile and to promote biking, walking, and public transit. With 100,000 active supporters and a committee of activists working locally in every borough, Transportation Alternative's fights for the installation of infrastructure improvements that will advance everyday transportation for all New Yorkers. Here to tell us more is the Manhattan Organizer for Transportation Alternatives, Thomas DeVito, Cristina Rodriguez, activist for Transportation Alternatives Bronx Committee, and Jill Guidara, field organizing manager. Welcome. I said that right? Yes. Yay, I win! <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I read this one as probably your mission statement, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, but can you tell us a little bit how Transportation Alternatives began? Sure. Uh, it began in 1973. Um, that was as, a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, we had our 40-year anniversary last year. Um, and we have been fighting ever since uh, to do exactly as you said, which is to reclaim New York City streets for uh, people to walk, uh, take public transit, and to bicycle. 80% mm -hmm. um, of our public space are streets and it's uh, most New Yorkers get around by these alternative modes of transportation okay. um, but as of you know historically they have not gotten equal treatment as far as public policy and uh, the role in kind of the public imagination so our organization really seeks to promote um, those. So. And from 1973 to now obviously there have been changes in the infrastructure uh, how, have, how, is, um, how has your organization helped to realize that? Um. So I would say uh, we work citywide, mm -hmm. and there's been um, a lot of improvements in the past 40 years. Um, I work specifically with our Bronx Activist Committee, uh, which Christina here is a part of. And right here in the borough of the Bronx, we've really um, seen a lot of improvements. But more than that, we're in this moment where we're hearing a lot of demand about how um, the way the streets are designed in the Bronx, um, it's time for them to be better reflective about how Bronx residents get around mm -hmm. and um, can be as good and as well designed as they are maybe in other parts of the city. Um, understandable. I mean, uh, our last mayor uh, was really pushing for biking, especially in Manhattan, and we've started, I st I've started to see that grow a little bit more here in the Bronx and in the outer boroughs as mm -hmm. well. Uh, how can we improve that? So. Yeah, cycling is the fastest growing mode of transportation in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but more than that, um, kind of the changes that began uh, six, seven years ago um, really benefited New Yorkers beyond just cyclists. Um, mm -hmm. Pedestrians, you've seen an incredible decrease in the number of injuries that have occurred on streets that have been redesigned. Mm -hmm. um, part of that redesign uh, includes bike lanes, but they also include pedestrian islands, right. a lot of longer light timing for people to cross the street. Mm -hmm. um, dedicated turning lanes and uh, things like that. This is called a complete street and it reduces crashes by around 30%. Um, so uh, one of the reasons that we're, we're on today is because we actually have a uh, initiative um, and an outreach happening this Saturday um, for Northern Manhattan and the Bronx, mm -hmm. uh, which is why the Manhattan organizer is here as well as uh, representatives from the Bronx. Uh, Beautiful. So, um, so well, what we will be doing is we'll be meeting at, uh, we'll be doing a street scan, uh, mm -hmm. which is we're going to get a bunch of community stakeholders, local residents. Um, we'll be meeting at a location, it's going to be 138th and 5th Avenue on the Manhattan side of Madison Avenue Bridge. Um, and then we will be walking around the streets on both the Manhattan side and the Bronx side, trying to determine where better infrastructure could be put in place. Um, the idea is to get a very much a participatory kind of public input, very grassroots, to find out what citizens in kind of northern Manhattan and the Bronx want. Um, it's going to be focusing on where a uh, network of bike lanes could be put in place, where pedestrian safety amenities could be added. Mm -hmm. um, and this is because uh, the Bronx and northern Manhattan have not received the same attention as certain midtown. places in <laughs> Midtown and lower Manhattan and, and northern Brooklyn. Um, and this is reflected kind of in the fact that there are, there are more crashes um, and there's more speeding. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more children hit in northern Manhattan and, uh, than there are in southern Manhattan by cars. Mm -hmm. um, 
so this is really about equity. This is about opportunity, um, economic mobility between, you know, increasing mobility between these two vibrant boroughs mm -hmm. will really benefit everybody in the area. Um, so we're hosting um, this with a bunch of community partners to really get the ball rolling in improving infrastructure in areas that have been ignored on this front um, for a very long time. That's wonderful. So, Christina, I'd love to get you in the conversation. Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about what you're doing and, and how you're part of the... Of the course. Uh, well, I am a local activist, Bronx resident. Um, I came to TA concerned about street safety. Um, so I spent three weekends out on different bridges connecting the Bronx to Harlem. And um, it, it was one and the same, the response. Uh, navigating your way onto these bridges is very treacherous. Um, you know, the Deegan seems to be a major... A major problem to cross, especially for mothers with children. I, I particularly timed a woman uh, waiting to get to just one, you know, the island in between uh, the street and the, and the bridge, and she waited a good six minutes. Wow. Um, a cyclist she const I talked to, she constantly dismounts at that light mm -hmm. to walk her way onto the bridge, which I don't blame her. <laughs> she, uh, quote, doesn't want to be, uh, I want to die by the Deegan. Uh, right. That line really <laughs> stuck with me. Um, also, at cars are even at risk. I saw a, a convertible T-bone by an illegal U-turning van. Right. So all street users are at at risk when mm -hmm. it comes to uh, accessing these Harlem bridges, and uh, they are definitely demanding right. that uh, we look at that and make it safer for everyone. I, I used to walk the 149th Street Bridge oh, okay. uh, <laughs> back and forth from the Bronx mm -hmm. to Manhattan, and so it, was de it was definitely a trek, and it was definitely treacherous, and it was mm -hmm. also a lot of pollution because traffic. Right. Mm. Uh, loud, unpleasant, and it's just, it's not very, it, it, it's ugly to look at. Let's just be straight. Let's just be real. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember even approaching that bridge on my bike, and I'm like, oh, this is, this is going to be a, this is going to be a story to tell, and yeah. definitely is. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. there, there are a lot of things, that I, I know oh, it's great that you guys are around and can take a look at these, and your initiative is happening this Saturday, you said? Saturday, uh, from 2 o'clock until 4. Mm -hmm. um, food will be provided from by Henry's Restaurant, and it's really delicious. Uh, so <laughs> if you want sandwiches and uh, spring rolls and some actually delicious soup, uh, cucumber and dill soup, it should mm -hmm. be provided there. Um, so, yeah, we, we want as many people uh, in the Bronx and northern Manhattan coming to this as possible. The more input that people have, um, the more data that we can bring back and kind of really make a compelling case that the public demand is here for changes to make these streets safer. That's wonderful. And that's specifically in the 138th Street side on mm -hmm. both ends of Manhattan yeah. and the Bronx. Are you looking into an other neighborhoods soon sure. or? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as, as Christina mentioned, we've heard really strong community demand. Um, we are having the street scan take place by the Madison Avenue Bridge this weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but it's really a bigger look at how these Harlem River bridges can serve as, as backbones for a more comprehensive bicycle and pedestrian network through the Bronx and through neighborhoods in northern Manhattan. Mm -hmm. um, so while uh, this weekend we are rallying around the Madison Avenue Bridge, we are constantly collecting input on where Bronx residents um, want to see better infrastructure, better bike network, um, safer crossings. Mm -hmm. um, we have some other street scans Indeed. coming up. Uh, yep, the following Sunday, which is the 27th, um, we will be at High Bridge area mm -hmm. on both mm -hmm. sides mm -hmm. um, of the river uh, doing a street scan there. Mm -hmm. um, I know particularly that's really dangerous on the Bronx side. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yes. Yeah. And <laughs> I mean, the, Man the Manhattan side too, you get plenty of the get plenty of complaints about uh, safety conditions up there. Um, and we will be, uh, it has not been, details are still uh, being worked out, but we will be having one more street scan in August, um, probably at the University Heights Bridge. Mm -hmm. um, the idea is to really not f focus on these bridges as saying they're the only problem, but to get a representative kind of sample of the southern part of, uh, the, area, of the area, which is the Madison Avenue Bridge, the middle uh, section, which is uh, the High Bridge, and then further up north with the University Heights, to really show that there's a, a universal yearning for better infrastructure, for more attention to be paid to these communities as far as their needs, mm -hmm. um, transportation-wise. So. That's brilliant. Thank you so much for your help. I mean, I I I've been a Bronx resident for about four years. I grew up in Queens, mm. so yeah, hey, hey. <laughs> so um, I know about in terms of like uh, Queens Boulevard was known as the Boulevard of Death yes. because of all the 
you know, accidents and whatnot, and so the islands were formed, longer lights, and that's the same thing that's been happening here at the Grand Concourse, yes. which has been wonderful. Yes. Lights have been longer, islands have been added, and it's definitely made a difference, I can see. It's, mm -hmm. It might be a little frustrating for drivers, and sometimes also for pedestrians, those of us who want to get across really quickly, but it's wonderful that you guys, an organization like yours, is helping to make that a reality and safer for everyone. So thank you so much for all your concern and those initiatives that are happening sat this coming Saturday, next Sunday, and we'll, there'll be another one in August. We'll let you know. Is there a website they can go to? Uh, yes, you can visit transalt.org, mm -hmm. and if you click the Get Involved button, uh, you will be able to find all of our campaigns that are currently, uh, that we're working on in all five boroughs. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There it is. That's the website right there on the screen. Everyone should get involved. This involves you, your children, everyone in the Bronx and the Upper Manhattan. It's important that we keep ourselves safe and our children safe. And before we go to break, we would like to share with you today's daily news features an article by Dennis Slattery taking an inside look at the Bronx 100 scavenger hunt organized by Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr. and the Bronx Tur Tourism Council as one of many of the year-long centennial celebration activities taking place in our borough. Check this out. The article highlights the two winning teams, the Huntington Hunters and the Bronx All-Stars, which included Ed Garcia Conde of Welcome to Melrose, Bronx historian Lloyd Alton, and culinary ambassador Baron Ambrosia, and Bronxnet's own executive director Michael Max Nobby. <laughs> For more on this event and other centennial celebrations, continue to tune into Bronxnet, and you can always visit ILoveTheBronx.com. We have to take a quick break. We'll be right back with more open. I already knew that I was going to go to college, you know, from a young age. I definitely want to major in political science. After that, I'm going to get my law degree. Then I'm going to come back to Detroit, boost the economy, become the mayor or something, try to make the situation better for other people. I feel like I owe it to the city. I'm determined. It's, it, it's going to happen. My name is Justin, and I am your dividend. A single ember that escapes from a wildfire can travel more than a mile. You can't control where the ember will land, only what happens when it does. Get Fire Adapted now at fireadapted.org. So you, you heard of the Chewbacca fish? Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Chewbacca who? Well, yeah. You heard of the Chewbacca fish, haven't you? I, uh, yes, I did. Okay. And can, just so the people at home know, describe it real quick for us. Uh, this side, but. but a fish that flies out of the water, like almost like a rocket. It goes like 12 feet in the air, and then what happens is it comes back down before it hits the water. It like flies into people's neck and like starts biting you in the neck and in the face. Well, I'll tell you one thing. If it's out there, I'm gonna catch it on camera because I've been out here with with my, with my camera for years. You know how the Chewbacca fish works? What happens is it, it shoots it like rockets out of the water, like five feet in the air. And then as it's come, it jumps, exactly, it jumps. And, and then what happens, like five feet in the air, comes down, you know, right before it hits the water, like it like does a psych, and, you know, one of these moves and flies into your neck and starts like biting you and stuff. Nah. They, don't, they don't have the fish like that out here, do they? Yeah, it's the, the Chewbacca fish. That's yeah, what they, they have it out here in the Bronx? Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. And then what happens is right before it comes and hits the water. Yeah, he died to hit somebody. Exactly. Yeah. Hello everyone. In the spring of 2013, the Partnership for a Healthier New York City put out a request for personal stories from New Yorkers about how alcohol caused problems for them, their families, or their communities. In response, they received hundreds of powerful and illuminating stories. Here to tell us more about uncovering alcohol's hidden harms is alcohol policy analyst of New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, Aviva Grasso, and Lena Orkin, the program manager of alcohol education at the Partnership for a Healthier New York City. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. So um, you put out this campaign 
which which organization put out the campaign? The partnership. The partnership. So you put out this campaign asking for stories. How many stories did you get? What was what was the response like for you? Sure. So at the partnership, one of our goals is to raise awareness about the hidden harms of alcohol, and we figured a way that we could do that would be to collect stories. And so we asked New Yorkers of all ages from every borough of the city, and we collected over 300 stories. And they ranged from topics around quality of life. So for instance, um, you know, being in a neighborhood where there's lots of binge drinking going on, it's, it's hard for neighbors. It can be loud, hard to sleep. There could be vandalism in the street. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got stories around violence, which is a high priority issue in the city. Uh, for instance, uh, there was a story about a young person whose mother was actually murdered due to someone drinking, and mm -hmm. even another story about young people being at a house party and there being drinking involved and people getting into a fight. And so and there's many more topics covered in the book, but uh, those are just a few. But we really were, really the goal is to try to highlight some of these stories and show collectively how alcohol does have an impact on our communities. And there's not just harm to individuals, but also harm to others as well. Right. And the, the New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene, obviously they're combating constantly uh, people abusing alcohol. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about campaigns that New York City is putting forth? Sure. So I guess uh, last week we put out a new data brief sort of sharing some of the harms associated with other people's drinking. So we surveyed people in 2012. Um, we surveyed over 5,000 people in New York City and we asked them in the past six months have you experienced harm due to somebody else's drinking? Mm -hmm. So that harm might be something like um, having to take care of somebody had, who had too much to drink but it might also be experiencing an unwanted sexual advance. Um, and so about 20%, well 22% of people said that they had experienced some sort of harm. So that's over a million people in New York City who say that they've been harmed due to somebody else's drinking. Mm -hmm. um, sort of in response to that, we recently launched a new ad campaign which is focused on um, inter uh, on reducing that risk of harm. And so it says just one more drink can hurt, mm -hmm. as opposed to what you always hear, one more can't hurt, right? right. And so um, we suggest that people can keep them their friends from hurting themselves or others by cutting them off before they've had too much to drink. So we're sort of trying to get it, reminding people that there are, as Lena said, a lot of different harms associated with drinking too much and that there is a point at which in social situations we have the opportunity to prevent those harms. I think I remember seeing some ads on the, the subway that says one drink ago you could have brought yourself home right. or something like that. Right, so that was the previous campaign and now we have a new one that just launched last week. So yeah, it was two drinks ago. Oh, two drinks ago. <laughs> Sorry. Two no, drinks ago. Okay. <laughs> One, one drink ago is this, right, I mean, everybody says, that, you know, there's that point, right? There's a tipping point somewhere. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, so can, we're talking about the secondhand effects mm -hmm. of binge drinking. In the stories that you have collected, obviously those were all secondhand. Was there some one story that maybe, like, stood out to you, something that really hit you, hit home for you? Sure, I think that it would be the story of the young person whose uncle was drinking and actually ended up... Um, murdering his mother and then took his own life and I really feel like it was that story really hit me because it's a young person and they knew exactly what was going on and they knew that alcohol was part of you know part of the problem um, it, it, it just sort of shows that it's not just you know it's not just about you sort of harming your body through alcohol you know we always talk about alcoholism liver disease drunk driving mm -hmm. but rarely do we talk about violence and how alcohol is a risk factor for violence um, including gun violence sexual assaults um, and also with quality of life in neighborhoods, I think that, you know, we, we don't think about the fact that when you live in a neighborhood where there's lots of drinking going on, the people who live there, you know, don't necessarily like the noise and like sort of all the, the commotion that comes, comes with it. So we definitely saw that in the stories, not just how people had stories about, you know, their own health, but also their family members and their communities as well. And in terms of like, uh, you're talking about communities that there were a lot of binge, like we're talking about colleges, like NYU area and right, like the Lower village, side. Lower yeah. East Side, sure. there's a lot of that going mm -hmm. on. How do we help reduce underage drinking? Because some of those kids are freshmen, they're 18, 19 mm -hmm. years old, they shouldn't be drinking, but they are. How do we help reduce that happening? That's a really tough question, <laughs> um, and, and it's one that people are always sort of trying to nail down. And, and really what we know nationally, and in New York City to a lesser degree is that people drink, young people drink the way they see adults drink. So if we want young people not to drink, we really need adults to sort of rein in their excessive drinking. States that have lower rates of drinking and have lower rates of underage drinking. Um, and, and so they really do go hand in hand. So another sort of angle on that is really looking at the whole environment that young people are existing in. Um, Young people actually, I won't say college students, but high school students in New York City are less likely to drink than they are in some other parts of the state and other parts of the country. That's and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> it surprises a lot of people, but I think it's because there are so many other things to do. You talk to a young person in rural Maine, 
there's not a whole lot to do, so they drink. In New York City, there are a lot more opportunities for young people, so they have other outlets, other things to occupy their time with. That's mm -hmm. interesting. I know that there's been a debate rising with the um, with marijuana being legalized in certain states and in certain areas. Uh, the difference between the effects of marijuana and alcohol, and people advocates for marijuana are always saying that alcohol is worse of two, and well, then if marijuana isn't legalized, then alcohol shouldn't be either. What how do we counteract that argument? What, what is the argument there? Well, at the partnership, we focus mostly on alcohol. And I think the reason why we, why, why we like to focus on alcohol is because it is, it is America's favorite drug. It is you know, more used than other drugs, that, including marijuana. And also, it's effect, it affects so many things that we don't realize. And again, that's sort of why we're so focused on the hidden harms, because there's lots of talk around, uh, uh, around liver disease, drunk driving. Uh, alcoholism, but there's not a lot of discussion around alcohol being connected to other high priority issues. For instance, violence. For instance, actually uh, wonderful to have transportation alternatives on earlier. Uh, actually one in three pedestrian fatalities, the pedestrian themselves were legally intoxicated. So drunk walking is also really dangerous. <laughs> Um, and actually, alcohol is the third leading preventable cause of death in this country. And so I think that's really the point of our work at the partnership and with the Department of Health is showing that alcohol is a high priority issue on its own, mm -hmm. and it affects many other high priority issues in our city. And so um, that's why I think it's great that there's a Department of Health campaign, why we've got this data brief looking at secondhand effects, and also our own book, you know, Uncovering Hidden Harms, uh, a collection of stories from everyday New Yorkers to help show, make those statistics come to life, that everyday people are being affected by this, um, by, it is a drug. <laughs> we don't right. like to call it a drug, but it is a drug. Right. Um, so, so I think that that's really important just to sort of recognize uh, how important of an issue it is, even though it doesn't always get the attention that it deserves. Yeah, it's funny, is people don't even realize that uh, drunk bicycling, you can also right. get a ticket. Sure. Like, that's a thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, it's very, very dangerous. So where can people go to find this book? Where can they purchase it, perhaps? Sure. So the book is free, and oh. it's available on our website, healthiernyc.org. Uh, and we also have a Tumblr page, so we want other New Yorkers to share their story. And that's hiddenharms.tumblr.com. Um, and also, you know, the Department of Health has wonderful resources on their website as well. Um, and uh, it's Can a really great opportunity. Sure, this is the this is the wonderful book that we just had published. On well, we're, on, we're on our there it is there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and Pit so marks. we're really excited to get this book out to to everyone, to everyday New Yorkers, to community leaders, to again to increase the priority level of alcohol, you know, being an issue in our city. Wonderful. And in terms of the New York City Department Department of Health and Hygiene, how can people get involved with your campaigns? How do they reach out to you? Sure. Well, I mean, I think the easiest way is to go to our website, which is um, nyc.gov slash health, and you can look up excessive drinking, and you can find the data report that way, and you can find um, the, the campaign that way. And interestingly, I think getting involved, the best way to get involved, actually, is through the partnership, where they have... Um, coalitions in all five boroughs and people can get in connected through the partnerships website and actually get involved in doing something about alcohol in their communities. Great. Thank you so much, ladies. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure coming into your homes and I'd like to thank our guests for joining us, our studio audience from the Children's Rescue Fund and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast at 10 p.m. on Cablevision Channel 67, Fios 33, or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. Have a great week and don't forget to keep your heart, your mind, and most of all, this channel wide open. Have a great day. drive buzzed, it could cost you around $10,000. You'll face major legal fees, major fines, and steep insurance penalties.